good afternoon, dear colleagues. Uh, I'm honored to chair the second session today, which is on peace and reconciliation. My name is Mboni Mohamed Mhita, a member of parliament from the United Republic of Tanzania, a member of parliament with the Pan-African Parliament, and also a president of the Pan-African Youth Caucus. And the session is on issues of peace and reconciliation. Looking at the issue of peace and reconciliation. We look at unity in our societies, building social cohesion, facilitating peace and reconciliation. Starting from our families, neighborhood, national level, and international level. Involving in committing to make peace, social cohesion is a priority. A very good morning to some, because I believe we sat we're, we'll be having some colleagues in New York. I think it's his morning with them. And good afternoon to my colleagues in Midrand. We also have issues on involving women in fostering peace, coexistence, and peace building, where we can view the society's aspect on women. We can also view on women's role in society and women in decision-making positions. These are realities in our societies. But also, look at the role of the representatives, the members of parliaments, role of parliamentarians and civil societies. Dear colleagues, parliaments being the representatives of the people, most elected and representing different groups in the societies, different religion, different tribes, different ethnicities, and etc. How do we play our part in building social cohesion, facilitating peace and harmony? Today, we do have five panelists for this session. And to start with, let me welcome Ms. Noela Alifwa, Usumange, a coordinator from Sofepadi, Democratic Republic of Congo. Madam Noela, you have the floor. Thank you for uh, the opportunity. As said, um, uh, the chair uh, lady, my name is uh, Noela Alifwa. I come from the Eastern Republic, uh, Democratic Republic of Congo. I am the co coordinator of the medical center of the uh, feminine uh, solidarity. Uh, for uh, peace and it is an NGO which works since 2000. We have uh, worked uh, in the situation of conflict and you know I'm going to be brief when there are conflicts uh, people who are mostly uh, affected are women and since uh, the period that we had started the organization. We have worked uh, th on three pillars. Uh, there was the human right, peace and uh, peaceful cohabitation. 
and we have uh, evolved from 2002 to 2000, 2009, and the situation seems to be uh, calm. And not long ago, uh, armed groups have b have multiplied in the community of the eastern, whether it is in South Kivu, North Kivu, and uh, more especially in Ituri. And even when we are in this hall, uh, we are being sent messages that these armed um, uh, forces have killed. And most people who are most affected are women, uh, children, as well as elder people. And because we are uh, assuming uh, the care, taking care, and I'm going to take from October 2018 until today, because there has been a lot of uh, um, attacks, attacks in the territory. Uh, there has been a lot of displaced uh, towards uh, secure places. And as they got there, they uh, started uh, dwelling, as we say, in the camps. And in the camps, you need to see how the situ what the situation is. There are those who could not bear to stay in the camps and went back in their communities and also underwent attacks where children and women were uh, killed. You can see the serious problem. And other communities, instead of going towards the cities, they were displaced towards the neighboring countries, Uganda as well as Rwanda to find uh, peace. But the people who are there attacking are our sons, our husbands, our cousins, because there are people within the communities of the armed forces, and there are people within the community. And when they attack, they come. They do not only uh, limit by uh, looting uh, the goods or their belongings, but they go straight away to attack the, the people, the weak people. I say weak in the sense that a woman, when there are conflicts, she seeks, her, she seeks for her child first, uh, elder people, uh, the parents which are, who are living with them, while the men can uh, move and that woman meets those people. And that time, when they come, they do not only stop uh, by raping, the, the, uh, that's the principle. They rape, they torture, and they kill in the presence of uh, the people around to show them that if they resist, and they will do more evil to them. And we've got precise cases that I'm just gonna mention quickly, there's a woman who assisted at the m she, she witnessed the massacre of her husband uh, and they took the child and put in the stomach of the father and he was thrown in the river and they also tortured the woman she was raped and they left her and you see those uh, the, the woman now it's three months that she's in a psychiatric uh, center. And there is also uh, people who have been raped. Up to now, they kill, they, they died. The daughter, uh, the taxi uh, driver who was with them, uh, they raped both of them, and now they are pregnant. And you can see that it is a situation that affects mostly the woman. And the woman uh, normally, A woman, if we can say, uh, at uh, back home or in Africa, or she is the being or the person who is more precious because she gives life. Uh, she raises, she protects. And now if she has to be attacked, if she has to be humiliated, I believe there are actions that has to be taken so that the woman may find herself, uh, she's a being, she's got a right to life, integrity, a right to security, and right to everything. You will see, as we work, 
uh, when it comes to the right in the taking care of all those people that are humiliated and uh, aggressed, attacked. So we also implicate the women. We want the women to work so that peace may come back. Because people who are leaving their villages, there are those who have been uh, who came from the from the city of Bunia, others coming from elsewhere. And uh, frankly speaking, I can tell you there are cases. I was talking about the cases of displaced. I believe for Rwanda and elsewhere is different. But you can s you must see the camps in which these people are welcomed, and you can see that uh, the houses that are built. It's only for a person or three, but you will find a family with five people in that house. In the promiscuity, the situation, the health situation, and food. And you know, back at home, uh, the rice and the mealy meal, these are things that you don't eat from Monday to Saturday. They have to eat it. They are compelled, they are women who are pregnant, young girls who are giving birth, some pregnant women, all of them are in the same place. We've got a thousand of cases of displaced. If you go in the city as well as uh, in the inner city, we are not counting those who, are, who have left and gone to, to the bordering countries because we don't go there, but we are on the ground and we uh, follow up and take care of them on the ground. But for peace, what must we do? So this woman who's always affected, she must do something for peace. That is how these uh, women who are displaced, these women who are there, who have suffered, we use them in order to uh, have, uh, create awareness uh, when it comes uh, to peace and pacific or peaceful cohabitation. And the women in Itori even went to meet the uh, groups, the armed groups, in order to speak to them, to in order to uh, do all their best to bring peace. Because back home, women have got a great role they have to go to the farm, they have to go to the market and do a little business for the well-being of the family. But now, if they are a case of displaced and they have no activities, they will go either uh, to uh, do uh, activities at the, uh, to people who welcome them, they uh, pay them in a very uh, moderate and low rate, and w women must be implicated in the pacification and also the communities in, in which the communities where people those are, who are attacking other communities come from we also have women there and uh, uh, fortunately women back home they gather uh, together with the women of the other community they come together to find ways in order to have peace so that people can live in peace. Because when you look at these communities that are always in conflict, these are communities that have been living uh, almost together. Some have been married. And uh, with this conflict, you see what happens uh, for the children. And most often we say, in certain communities, in uh, the other communities that attack often, we also have women who, have the, who, are informa who are informed of what is happening. They need to train, speak to these women, speak to their chiefs, to the uh, armed groups, armed forces that are in their community in order to stop and bring peace. And when you see these people who uh, take arms to go and kill, they are very miserable. We uh, do not produce arms. But you will find these miserable people with arms. They've got machetes. And we ask a thousand questions. Where do all these weapons come from? And a woman, it can contribute. It can work so that peace from both sides, whether in the community of the attacked or the communities that it is affected. 
it is the same problem, for instance, now for the woman. We need awareness. There must be dialogues. The, she must participate in negotiations. Uh, often you will see that when there are negotiations, when women participate, you find that uh, most often their number is limited uh, when it comes to men. You find more men, a lot of men, and less women when there are negotiations, and that is a problem. And the second problem uh, concerns, I can say, members of the civil society. The civil society, they are part of the armed groups. They are also part uh, from those communities, a uh, civil society. We don't only have NGOs. We've got religious leaders. All those people must work. They must come together and seek uh, not to uh, hide, uh, but they need to speak exchange in order to find peace. Because with peace we can uh, build everything that we build, houses, schools, and so on, are destroyed in one day. Whatever we have uh, built for 20 years are destroyed in one day. And then we have to start afresh. Then you find most children are displaced in camps. They do not go to schools. They are limited. So a woman, uh, the communities, the civil society must uh, work uh, together for peace. Uh, we have to commend uh, because uh, recently uh, when there was a violence uh, from January uh, up to now, there are uh, 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 customary uh, chiefs that are implicated in the exchange so that there must be peace. And because they also understand When there are problems, there is always a problem when it comes to the presence of these people. When they participate in the negotiations of peace, there are also leaders who are more uh, uh, heard by the armed forces. And I believe that is important. And there is also the part that concerns uh, parliamentaries. They we voted by the community. Uh, they know they have to act, they have to speak, they have to go in the communities in order for them to create peace as well. There are those who also just limit in the parliament, they stay in the parliament, but they do not know what is happening in the community. And there are uh, uh, people that are frustrated, but even if we are frustrated, we cannot destroy the community. Whether it is the parliamentaries, they need to come together to with, with the so, uh, civil society so that peace may return. And when there is peace, everyone must benefit from that peace. I just want to tell you I'm going to, uh, to, to end so that I mustn't take a lot of time. And you know, since January up to today, we have welcomed those women. I'm co coming back to those women because it's something that is really affecting us. We have almost 624 women who came, who are from communities where we were uh, sexually uh, ag uh, aggressed. And you see people like that, uh, those 624, they need uh, the help of humanitarian. They need the help of the government. But we have to command because at least the government has also brought some help uh, to this displaced. But this is help that is limited because the needs are uh, enormous. And there are uh, international NGOs which are there, which are helping the displaced, 
But I say often that they can help. But the first thing is that they need to work for peace to return so that their woman may find her dignity and children go back to school and elders may live in peace. I say it and I thank you. Thank you, Ms. Noela, for a very touching, comprehensive presentation. Uh, Ms. Noela has been working with the civic society, working with women in conflict areas. Uh, and as we have all heard, she has elaborated on post effects of society affected by conflicts, and especially women. And because Ms. Noela has to catch <laughs> a flight today evening, Please allow me to give the floor to you. Um, if there's anyone who has any particular deliberation in regard to what Ms. Noella has said before we continue with other um, uh, speakers. So if there's anyone in the floor that wants to speak, oh, I've seen Honorable Kone. Merci, Madame. Thank you, uh, Madam uh, President. Um, frankly, uh, understand that it is uh, uh, someone uh, that is shaken, uh, that's uh, given uh, the flow to, to think. I would like to commend uh, Noella for her courage. She has uh, spoken a lot of about the uh, internal displaced and also external uh, displaced people. She spoke about vulnerable groups for which she's uh, fighting daily uh, for many years, almost 20 years. Uh, this uh, barbaric and inhuman violence uh, uh, to do evil just for the sake of evil, that is what she lives daily. Once again, as uh, we said, these are the consequences of certain practices or certain things. So we mustn't uh, hide uh, behind. We cannot uh, take care of a wound without being w to cleaning it. These are the consequences. It is about time, about time that we look at the root causes uh, of all this. Now I would like to talk about the mission of the United Nations and uh, call up on the, the UNHCR because they are under the umbrella of the United Nations. The uh, DRC uh, knows the mission of the United Nations for with more than 30,000 men, but we cannot understand that 30,000 men facing a few hundred uh, drugged or uh, f crazy people, and we are unable to put an end to this. And there is, uh, we need to ask ourselves that question since we say, well, as we said since yesterday. And now I would like to go back to what Noela said uh, about the parliamentaries that needs to come uh, over to, uh, to DRC. Maybe take the case of Burkina Faso. Today in Burkina Faso, there are a lot of parliamentaries uh, where, the, uh, uh, where there are circumscriptions that are in the hands of terrorists. Even the population is uh, fleeing uh, those uh, zones. You heard about uh, the zones uh, 200 kilometers from Ouagadougou where you saw the five buses uh, being attacked to say that uh, maybe these parliamentaries cannot go uh, to uh, their circumscription because of certain reasons. But I commend you uh, for your courage. Uh, may God bless you for the work you're doing. Thank you, Honorable Kone. Do we have anyone? Yes, sorry, I don't have your name and I have to point my finger at you. Uh, Please, you have the floor. Um, shukran. Thank you, Honorable Chair. 
and thank you for Mrs. Noela. I believe that there is a recommendation and a question. The Security Council 25 for the year 2000, which is the first declaration that um, uh, talks about armed conflict uh, that affects women and children. And now we are in 2020. We will um, uh, be celebrating 20 years for this declaration. This is a good opportunity for recommendation to list um, all the obligations towards women and children. My question to Mrs. Noela is, uh, how does the peacekeeping uh, efforts according to the UN um, uh, to achieve equality between men and women? Um, my second question, how does the uh, counselor achieve the equality between between men and women uh, on a general basis. Sorry, can we have your name, please? Uh, my name is Farouk Tahiri from Morocco. Je m'appelle Noela. My name is Noela Alifwa. Morocco, um, because Honorable Kones was more of commending and um, giving courage mm -hmm. and giving us a highlight on consequences of certain <laughs> actions that has, are happening in our societies. And hence that um, the question that came from my brother Farouk from Morocco uh, is very much integrated to what um, Miss Fasak Pave, Senior Advisor of UNHCR uh, from the headquarters. And we also have Mr. Hank John Brinkman, Chief of UN Peacemaking Fund, United Nations headquarters. May I take this opportunity to give the opportunity to Ms. Safak, who will now join hands with Mr. Hank from New York. And let's see what they have to say. And I'm quite sure that your question is also quite relevant to what Mr. Hank will have to tell us. Thank you, Ms. Safa. Please go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. I would like to ask, uh, because New York is waiting for the connection, if uh, we may have the connection maybe uh, created here, so that perhaps um, Honorable MP's uh, question on the UN peacebuilding efforts can be immediately responded uh, by New York. Oh. Hi, good morning. Uh, good morning, Hang uh, Yan. Good morning. Can you hear me? Yes, yes, we can hear you. Madam Chair kindly uh, gave the word to us uh, because there was uh, the, the initial intervention by Madam uh, Usumange. Uh, on the very grassroots works, uh, work and how women are affected by violence and how violence and conflict creates displacement. Um, it was very moving and touching as the Madam Chair has also mentioned before we moved and connected with you. But thank you for bearing with us because Honorable MP from Morocco has actually posed the question on UN peace building efforts. So we thought we better come back to you on after this Q&A. Q &A. Uh, for, your, uh, for you to enlighten us on the UN peace building efforts that's going on and also how to connect it with the role of the parliaments. Good. So I'm very happy, uh, very happy to join you. Um, the, the United Nations peace building efforts over the last few years have been really guided by um, two resolutions that were adopted in April 2016. Uh, simultaneously by the General Assembly and the Security Council, um, and they have become known as the Sustaining Peace Resolutions because they introduce the concept of sustaining peace um, next to uh, peace building. <clears throat> there are really four key elements um, to these resolutions um, that I would like to emphasize, um, and I think uh, some of them may really pertain to um, the discussions you are having as, as well. Um, the first one is that um, the resolutions very clearly recognize that uh, peace building needs to happen throughout the conflict cycle, before, during, and after. Um, so this really moves away from a linear approach 
um, to peace building um, and limiting peace building only to post conflict settings. Um, the second one is that we really need coherent and comprehensive approaches. Um, the nature of conflict is changing quite dramatically um, with many more non state actors and um, uh, external uh, linkages, um, whether they are among uh, transnational organized crime or terrorist groups or uh, spillovers such as um, uh, displaced people. Um, and then Therefore, we really need to look at uh, regional issues, but also at comprehensive approaches that look at a variety of issues um, because um, the drivers are very complex and multidimensional. Um, and, and I think the issues we are dealing with cannot be just responded by um, one single approach, whether there's, uh, uh, and certainly not just a military or security uh, based approach. Um, uh, the third element is, is really a, a focus on national ownership and, and, and um, inclusivity. And, and this is, I think, where parliaments come in. Um, the resolutions really uh, very strongly emphasize that peace building needs to be led by national actors. Uh, and this very much goes beyond governments. Um, so it explicitly recognizes uh, civil society, uh, the private sector, um, but also, um, uh, we should think about uh, parliaments as a very important actor um, in creating the conditions of change that are necessary to, to change the um, status quo uh, and perhaps uh, a, a create a coalition of, of agents of, of, um, of change. And then uh, the fourth really key, elements, uh, key element is, is the emphasis on partnerships. Um, here is also perhaps uh, nothing really new, but the emphasis is very strong. Um, uh, the United Nations is never alone, um, and the UN is rarely the biggest operator, um, and therefore we really need to work with regional and sub-regional organizations, uh, international finance institutions, um, and, and, and of course uh, the situation and the strength and the capabilities um, and the expertise in, that exists in regional and sub-regional organizations um, is just uh, uh, unavoidable and, and, and a very important uh, ally and partner for the UN, whether it's ECOWAS in West Africa, um, working around um, uh, Gambia um, to, to recognize the result of the re uh, election a few years ago or what is happening right now in Guinea-Bissau, um, so these are, are, are really important uh, um, elements. And if I may, I, I would really like to emphasize uh, four additional points that really points to the linkages between peace building and displacement. Um, and that, as that is one of the main topics of your conference. Um, the first one is that, that peace building is, is something that really can go to the roots of, of conflict. I mean, the UNHCR, of course, is, is, a, is an excellent um, a, a organization in the UN system that is, provides uh, um, essential care for people who are displaced, um, but it doesn't necessarily um, go uh, address the root causes of, um, of displacement, um, but we do need to actually work um, on conflicts and in conflicts at the same time. So the partnering with UNHCR, with other entities, um, is very important. And it's not so much how, uh, what we do, but it's really how we do it. And then we, it, it is possible to, to bring different groups together and work on reconciliation, work on land rights, the rule of law, uh, and of course uh, issues of, of citizenship are, are very important. The, the second element is that we, um, it's critical that a dialogue takes place between displaced people and, um, uh, and, and host communities. Um, and we know that, that inclusion is, is one of the key principles of peace building and without exclusion, um, with, with, without inclusion and, and, and when some groups are, feel excluded, um, the risk of, of return to violent conflict is, uh, increases dramatically. And this is really important in terms of national processes, um, that there is a dialogue that includes um, displaced people, um, the internally displaced people, of course, um, but also uh, refugees um, and, and stateless uh, people. 
Um, the the um, uh, third element um, is is related to uh, to that, and that is uh, really making sure. Um, in, in terms of the uh, uh, national development plan, the uh, sustainable development goals, um, that there is also an emphasis on, um, on, on displaced people, whether they are, or again, whether they are citizens or, or, or not. And then finally, um, the Peace Building really focuses on, on strengthening the institutions that are necessary to deliver social services to um, the people. Um, and that, of course, then uh, also um, needs uh, to focus on the needs of um, displaced people, uh, whether they are internally or, or, or um, displaced or, or refugees. Um, there's a beautiful phrase in the sustainable resolutions that I started about is that um, a, we, we people they need to look at the needs of all segments of the population. Um, and then, so that is a very important and strong signal that um, we need to focus on uh, 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 strengthening the institutions that deliver the services. Um, in particular of countries, of course, where displaced people um, don't live in, in camps, but are really integrated in the communities. Um, whether that is in, in Jordan with Syrian refugees, um, but it's also often the case in, um, in Africa, um, including uh, in, in West Africa around the, 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 the wars in, in Liberia and, um, and Sierra Leone, um, or the, the turmoil in Cote d'Ivoire. Um, you saw a lot of people that were, f were, were fleeing and just settling themselves um, in existing communities um, and be, that can, of course, cause conflict and, and dialogue mechanisms, as I described before, are in that sense very important to, to uh, talk about these conflicts. Um, but it's also emphasizing this, the need for strengthening um, a, a local authorities to deliver so, social services um, to people. Um, and that's why we, I think we often should avoid um, the, referring to uh, that government only um, uh, need to address uh, the needs of citizens because um, that is a very limited concept and that excludes um, refugees and it excludes um, also uh, stateless people. Um, and so that is a responsibility, um, I think, for, for governments as well. And of course, in that regard, parliaments have a, a very important role to play to, to emphasize that. So maybe I'll leave it here as, as introductory remarks, and I'm, I'm very um, happy to, to uh, answer questions. Um, and I, I'm sorry, I, I did not get the question of the Moroccan um, delegate, um, so if that um, it could be repeated, if that is what was the question addressed to me, that, that would be uh, great. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Hank Jan. Uh, it will be actually Madam Chair now who would like to turn to the floor uh, for some questions uh, that may uh, that uh, honorable MPs may have for you. Um, but if there is any translation issues, because we do know that you are not getting the translation interpretation there, uh, so Madam Chair uh, kindly offered uh, to basically wrap up the questions for you, um, if necessary. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Hank. Uh, you have actually somehow managed to summarize most of our notes. But uh, what is more encouraging is uh, you have given us um, a highlight on what actions that the United Nations have taken on peace resolution for peace building in the, in the national level and international level. So please allow me to give the opportunity um, to our sp panelists. Uh, as a matter of fact, Ms. Noel will be leaving, so please allow me to give the floor to our fellow MPs. Um, if there's anyone who has any question, comments, views in regard to what Mr. Hank has said, please go ahead. You have the floor. Farouk, we have Farouk from Morocco. Uh, thank you to Mr. Hank. Uh, 
and thank you for all the information that's presented. Mr. Hank, you have uh, spoken about the peacekeeping uh, missions, and in terms of the partnership uh, to understand a common understanding for the sources of conflict, and you also have spoken about the exchange of information for early warning systems and being able uh, to predict the tension. And also, you have spoken about the uh, good intentions missions. How does this take place through a partnership with the international organizations? I repeat my my question that I have stated previously, which is around 2020, we would be celebrating the 23 of the Security Council declaration for uh, Article 25, which was issued 2000, which is and an, an, an find that the, the impact of the forced conflicts on women and children. This 20 years is an important milestone for this declaration. So my question is, how does the peacemaking, peacekeeping uh, missions uh, achieve the equality between uh, men and uh, women? Thank you. Ms. Safa, oh, you I want can, I can please, up if, if I may, uh, Honorable MP, if I will. Um, Hank Yan, so the question uh, from the Honorable MP, uh, Honorable MP Farouk uh, from a Moroccan delegation has come on the basically wrapping up on, on what you were saying uh, as a sum up and also uh, indicating that in 2020 there will be the celebration of the Article 25, uh, Resolution 1385 as well. Um, so uh, while this, this Security Council resolutions are coming up uh, in their anniversaries, um, how does keep uh, peacekeeping missions keep men and women equal, and how does it possible to have that, that kind of equality reflected in peace building missions as well as peacekeeping missions? Uh, what do you have in place to ensure the, uh, the equality of men and women's participation in these missions? So thank, thank you so much um, uh, for, for this uh, uh, emphasis on, on the important role of, of women and the equality um, in between men and women. Um, so we have a, a couple of, of important frameworks. The, um, we have the 1325 Security Council Resolution that was adopted um, in, in, um, uh, in 2000, and indeed we'll have its 20th anniversary next year. Um, and one of the subsequent uh, resolutions, 1889, um, really emphasized the important role of women um, in peace building. Um, and we very strongly believe that, that women um, really need to be at the forefront of peace building efforts. Um, we, we think that uh, the, the share of women in Parliament is, is a very important indicator. Uh, they they're, they're um, affected in a different way um, by by the conflict than men. Um, and they uh, of course have played a very important role in, in peace processes, such as in Liberia. Um, and we really uh, think that that um, they should uh, have a, a, a key key role. Um, so we have recommended. Um, in a report that the Secretary General produced in 2010, um, a seven-point action plan with regard to gender responsive building. Um, and um, it emphasizes the important role of women in processes, um, in national governance, uh, um, in uh, parliament, um, uh, in economic recovery, um, and also uh, recognizing the important uh, importance of addressing the, the justice aspects of women in particular, um, whether that is uh, a fight for impunity against uh, sexual and gender-based violence um, or uh, land rights and, and having really the equality between men and women enshrined in the law so that women can own and inherit uh, property and, and, and land. Um, uh, it, it, what is also very important is that seven for an action plan on gender responsive peace building is, is also includes a, a target that 15% of expenditures in conflict settings need to be focused on um, a, a gender equality uh, and women's empowerment um, as a principal objective um, for at least 15%, so one five. Um, and the peace building fund that uh, we manage in my office um, have has reached reached that target, um, and then, but unfortunately, 
Um, we are the only fund within the UN. Um, but we also encourage very much national authorities to uh, adopt that 15% uh, target. Um, it, there's also some evidence that, uh, um, and recommendations um, that uh, women should, should have at least 30% in uh, of the seats in parliament um, to create a critical mass of, of actors um, that, that can really make a difference. Um, and, and of course, as you well know, uh, the, the country um, that actually leads globally in the number of women in parliament is, is Rwanda, um, where actually uh, more than 50% of, of the seats are, are taken by women. And they have played a very critical role in, in changing uh, various issues, including around uh, land rights um, and inheritance law. Um, so we think this is absolutely critical, also in peacekeeping operations. So there is a target um, that uniform personnel in peacekeeping operations um, should take uh, at least 20% um, of, the, uh, of the, the military and the police. Um, and because we, we know that, that women peacekeepers um, is, is very important, in particular around uh, issues of, of protection of civilians, um, and sexual uh, and gender-based violence and conflict um, because it, it really creates much more trust with, with, with the victims. Um, so we are really working very hard on, on that. Um, and of course, we're also trying to um, meet the gender equality requirements in our own organization. And the new Secretary General, uh, he's, he's not, almost not uh, quite new anymore because he started in, on January 1st, 2017, but um, he has made it a very strong objective um, to have gender equality in the, in the senior ranks. And he has achieved that in, in his own cabinet and also uh, within uh, the appointments of resident coordinators uh, at, the, at the global level. Um, so we, we think this is really, really critical. Uh, maybe one other aspect I want to, to mention, <clears throat> and that is the important role of communities um, in, in early warning and, um, and peace building. And uh, as the um, uh, Honorable uh, Delegate of Morocco emphasized, um, in terms of early warning systems and, um, and knowing what the conflict dynamics are at the country level, women play a very important role in the family and the communities in, in, the, in, um, in, in urban areas. Um, and we need to be able to, to uh, empower them uh, and, and uh, use them um, for uh, peace building efforts um, and because they will be much more effective um, at that local level where, where women have an, an incredible amount of, of um, uh, information uh, about conflict dynamics um, that, that the UN um, uh, needs and, and can benefit from. Um, so we have, are developing new uh, community engagement guidelines that really emphasize that um, as well. Um, I hope I have answered the, the question um, uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you, Hank. Um, Madam Safak, do you want to take the floor? Thank you very much, and there was confirmation from the Moroccan delegation that it was uh, it, your uh, answer was uh, the answer was completely satisfactory. Uh, Hank Yan, I also would like to add another angle there because we mentioned of the partnerships, and uh, there was also a mention in the intervention uh, by the honorable MP on the good intention on partnerships, but how does these partnerships work? Uh, with pe peace building efforts and, and processes. Um, well, there is definitely, there is no doubt, I think uh, there's a consensus in this room after also Ms. Usumange's very grassroots and very uh, clear illustration of, uh, of connection uh, from the civil society side um, of healing uh, efforts actually, uh, post-conflict, post-violence um, uh, with displaced women. Um, there is no there is no discussion or debate or doubt about women's participation in peace processes built on these experiences and sharing these experiences is extremely important um, and very effective as well. And evidence shows us actually there are very long lasting, it actually contributes to longer peace processes. And you've, you've mentioned of Rwanda and in Rwanda in the peace building processes after 
uh, in the aftermath of the conflict and um, genocide. Uh, so um, there was actually gachacha laws, which played a big, uh, big, um, it was traditional laws that were used and utilized uh, to reach out to the society again to build a peaceful coexistence once again. And women were the agents of those uh, who actually started building social cohesion, which later on translated into political seats and political space equally, and now actually even more than 60% uh, uh, we are looking at, which is a great pride uh, for the rest of the world parliaments um, to also uh, get as a role modeling. Uh, but um, I mean, the global, coming back to the global compact on refugees, um, now with this new global compact that in the last two days you've been hearing a lot in detail, we have a recognition of parliaments as actors, recognition of cities, local authorities, just like Hank Yan has mentioned, as actors to engage with, uh, as well as a global compact on refugees recognizes um, the importance of participation of those populations, communities, individuals that are affected by conflict and violence and who are displaced internally or as refugees um, in actually their role in addressing the root causes uh, of displacement uh, and therefore the peace building processes. So the need to facilitate and encourage their uh, active engagement in peace and recon reconciliation processes is very much embedded in the global compact, which allows us actually to build new partnerships in the multi-stakeholder partnerships approach. Uh, and uh, until now, it was very, very, um, very little example that we've seen actually refugee women taking very active part in peace delegations, peace building de delegations um, that were uh, working on the root causes uh, or to, to resolve matters uh, for, for viable, um, to ensure actually return processes as well. Uh, but without these kind of experiences being shared or refugee women, displaced women's experiences being included as an active voice and agents of change, uh, we don't think it's possible. So therefore, UN Peacebuilding Fund and UNHCR is working uh, under the um, humanitarian development and peace nexus, uh, that umbrella, uh, to strengthen this part of root causes, addressing root causes, that's also uh, one of the objectives of Global Compact uh, on Refugees. Uh, Hank Yan, uh, would you have anything to add into this, that refugee women's role and participation uh, how they may play a role, perhaps, in this kind of partnership angle. No, I, I, I think you're, you're absolutely right, and, and you've covered quite a, quite a bit of ground. Um, it, it's it's uh, very much the case that in including in um, a truth and reconciliation processes and um, a, a also uh, healing, trauma healing, uh, it, it, there is there's a very important role for, for women, um, in particular, of course, that they have often been um, uh, the victims. Um, so they, they really need to be, to be heard and um, uh, go through uh, an, an, an additional justice process. And of course, there are very good examples uh, of that. The Kakacha courts in, in Rwanda, you mentioned, uh, you know, funding talk um, in Sierra Leone has also played a very important role in, in um, uh, uh, perpetrated, uh, confessing their crimes in the communities uh, and having a dialogue uh, about that. Um, and I think these efforts are, are need to be very much tailored by the circumstances of the country, um, the, the political, historical, and social economic uh, context. Um, and they uh, um, uh, preferably needs to come from really national leaders, um, as, of course, the Kakacha Courts and, and, and Fumble Talk in Sierra Leone have. Um, some of these processes uh, can be supported by external uh, actors. Um, uh, the, uh, the, the Peace Building Fund, indeed, has supported uh, some of these efforts, um, including now in Gambia, uh, where there is a similar uh, Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission uh, uh, operating at the moment. Um, and so that is, 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 is very important. We have also supported reparations in, in Sierra Leone, 
uh, for example, uh, they can play uh, an important role in, in, in trying to move a society uh, um, forward and forward-looking. Uh, and I think that is a very important aspect of reconciliation, that it's not only uh, backward-looking and looking at, at the crimes committed, but also uh, looking forward and creating a, 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 a sense of social cohesion in the country um, a, and a sense of vision of, of what the country uh, is and how it, it treats its, um, its, its own history. Um, it is really important to, to, to keep that uh, country um, uh, intact and, and, and really reduce the risks of, of violent conflict. Um, and maybe you say one more thing about the, the partnerships that we, that we have. Uh, we have an MOU with the African Union and, and also with ECOWAS um, to uh, uh, focus, uh, for example, on, on uh, the funding of human rights observers. Um, we have done that, for example, in Burundi and Central African Republic. Um, where uh, the, the Peace Building Fund paid for African Union uh, human rights uh, observers. Um, so that is, is really critical. Um, women also play a very important role in, in, um, um, in the election processes themselves, not only as, as active um, uh, candidates for standing for parliament, but also in observing um, that the elections are held properly, um, that uh, uh, they are free and fair, um, and uh, uh, that uh, in, in various uh, West African countries, um, we have uh, uh, supported, the Peace Building Fund has supported Casdeve, uh, uh, observation rooms, um, uh, where women in particular um, were, were supported in, in, um, in, in, in observing the, the, the process of the election itself and making sure um, that no violence takes place um, and that um, there no uh, um, you know fraud takes place um, and, and that the elections are really following a, a constitutional uh, process um, and that is that is really critical um, in, in, in other places like Burundi we have supported also uh, women um, mediators to really address local conflicts. Uh, we're actually also doing that in Liberia through the Palava huts, uh, mostly dealing with, with family disputes, and also with land disputes, um, because of, of the important role that women play in the communities, it's really critical that, that those are, uh, efforts are, are supported. Um, and um, so I, maybe I, I, I leave it here, and if there are any more questions, I'm, I'm happy to, uh, to re respond to them. Thank you. Um, uh, Hank Yan, uh, as, as discussed with Madam Chair, I think th uh, this will be a wonderful, con I mean, th we thank you for the wonderful contribution. And uh, as UNACR, we are also looking forward to our partnership and future uh, projects together to also give a voice and active role to displace women's experiences to take part in this uh, peace and uh, reconciliation processes. Thank you so much for joining us in the conversation. Uh, and um, I, we would like to thank you, and uh, I would like to give the word to Madam Chair to conclude. Thank you. Thank you, Hank, for giving us your time, giving us the highlight on action taken by the United Nations on peace resolution for peace building, and how you have emphasized on the need for national leaders um, to take major role in enhancing peace and reconciliation. I'm sure that most of us have taken that and uh, definitely we're going to work on that. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for having me. Um, it was my pleasure to, to join you um, and I wish you every success uh, both at the meeting and in your national efforts um, to, build, to build peace. Thank you so much. Thank you, Hank. Anything? Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you very much. So we are we are definitely done with Miss Noella, who had to travel, and we've had the opportunity to listen to Hank from New York. We've also had an opportunity to listen to Miss Safak, 
And may I now take this opportunity to give the floor to Ms. Ayo Ayola Amale, President of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, Ghana Section. Welcome, Mama. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I would like to talk about the roles that um, women play, particularly when it comes to development. We know that um, women have voice, women have power to effect change. We have seen that happen practically. I've been on the field. I know the role that women play. And um, we were excited after 55 years the United Nations recognizes those roles by bringing to being the United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325. Even that alone shows that um, women have been advocating for years. We've had resolutions. We've had 1820, 1888, 1889, 1960 resolutions. All these were efforts of women. Women have been on, in the field advocating I mean, saying that we are here, we've been doing so much, no one recognizes us, no one sees us. So when 1325 came, it was good. But how far with 1325? We have not realized a lot, but we have, I mean, we've, we've started something, and we believe that we will accomplish a lot with that. Because without women, you all know there's no development. So what roles do we play? We play a lot. I would like to talk about You've heard Noella say a lot about what women pass through. Most of the time you have conflict. Yes, it's a gender thing. Men are affected, children are affected, old people are affected, but women are affected most. We know that. Women suffer a lot. They have traumatic, ex ex traumatic experiences. They are violated sexually. They are, they, they, are, they are psychologically destroyed, emotionally destroyed. They lose their husbands to war. They lose their children. It's enormous. Yet, when it comes to sitting down on the table, women are excluded in mediation, they are excluded in negotiation processes, they are excluded. I'm a professional mediator. It's hard to find a woman mediate. You find men on the table, women are not there. And some, most times, they are discussing issues that relate to women. I mean, where are we going from there? When you are talking about me, I'm not there. So what are you talking about? Because I need to tell you how I feel it, how I see it. So these are issues that are around 1325 that we're talking about. Women play a very critical role. We saw that happen in Liberia, Lehman Bowie and Whipnet. Charles Taylor, we know who he is, we know how tough he is, in court, and we know how, how daring he is. She confronted Charles Taylor. He said, go get the rebels. And the women of Whipnet went and they had discussion with the rebels. These are women. And they brought them to Charles Taylor to have conversation. And you know what happened in the end. Liberia at least got rid of Charles Taylor and had government. And we're not saying it's the best government, but they moved ahead at least to a point. And we have women voices being heard. So you, we've seen that in Liberia. We've seen it happen in U, U, Uganda. The LRA, LA, LA, a fellow colleague who is um, called Betty Bigombe. She's a prominent um, African mediator. She's done a lot with LRA in Uganda. We've seen that, we've seen happen in Uganda, Rwanda, so many countries in Africa where we have issues and women suffer daily. Why are we excluding women? Women have rights. It's our fundamental rights to, to be heard, for our voice to be heard. We have agency. We need to be, to be allowed to say what issues are addressed on the table that has to do with us. We need to, to say what we feel, how we feel it, and what should be done about our issues, about our children, about our husbands, about our uncles, about our brothers. So when we say women should be heard, we're talking about women has to be heard because it is their fundamental human rights. They deserve equal rights. Equality is what 1325 is about. Equality at the table, in negotiation, in mediation. We have seen it succeed. We have sustainable peace when women participate in these processes. So it is important that they are part of the processes. We have seen it succeed when you have women in governance. 
you, women, women issues are addressed. When you don't have women in governance, you don't have anything because you, our issues won't be discussed the way it should be discussed and nothing will be done about it. But when we're there, we know where the shoe pinches and we say, yes, this, this is the problem on ground. We work with communities, NGOs work with communities and we play a critical role in the communities. You heard him, uh, Mr. Hank, <laughs> he said something that I, I was so happy about. He said women in the communities have critical role to play. What they do is they negotiate, um, they, they reconcile between, they reconcile communities, they sit at the table in negotiation. Women have been playing that role for ages, but they are not recognized. They do it grassroots level. Why can't they do it regionally? Why can't they do it nationally? Why can't they do it, I mean, internationally? That's why we have FemWise today. I'm a member of FemWise. FemWise is saying we have qualified women. We can build their capacity. Women are qualified, but they are, they are being relegated to the background because they don't want our voices to be heard. How can we have development in Africa when women's voices are being silenced? So we need women in all peace building processes, in governance, we need women. In, 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 in development, we need women. We need women who can, I mean, sit and talk about what women are facing. They are there in the community. When you have NGO that is strong, you have strong democracy, women propel that. Women propel strong democracy. In, we are NGO workers. We do a lot in our communities. We, we have action plans. The 1325 he spoke about, we have developed national action plans. This is our role. We develop action, national action plans with context, the context within that same community. Every community has their specific context. You need to speak to the women in those communities to know what it is their problems are, what are they facing. So grassroots women play a critical role in ensuring peace, sustainable peace. So they need to, you need to bridge that gap between them, the private sector, and the public sector. Who does that? The, C the CSOs, the NGOs. These are our roles, and women also play a very strong I mean, role in that. We are watchdogs. We, we, we protect fundamental human rights of the vulnerables, those who cannot have a voice, who don't have a voice, those who are not heard, those who are being marginalized. These are our roles. Women are nurturers. Women are home builders. We build homes, we build communities. When you give us the chance, we can change we can change circumstances that beyond your control, beyond your recognition, rather, because we do a lot in impacting knowledge as experts. In NGO, we have women who taught 1325. I actually teach 1325. So what I do is we contextualize it. We, we have national action plans. We make it adaptable to a particular context. It's a, it's a resolution. You are supposed to use it to fit your own um, 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 specific environment and community. So we do that. Women do that. And we also educate other women on what 1325 is. 1325 is not theory. It's, 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 it has to be put into practice. In every aspect, there must be a feminist angle. That's gender mainstreaming. Everything must have a feminist angle. You have to look at it with a feminist lens. What is this to do with women? How does it affect women? How does it promote women? These are issues that affect development. If you leave women behind, you are leaving effectively 50% of your population behind, and you're never going to make progress. So women are watchdogs. Women are advocates. We advocate for human rights. We advocate for governance. We advocate for uh, accountability. We want accountability. We want government to be accountable. When you remove CSOs, you remove NGOs and women, there's no accountability. It, it, it means that there's no one who is going to call, I mean, government to order when they are going astray. We, you need to have checks and balances. NGOs are taught, said to be third sector. We are not third sector. We bridge the gap between the private sector and the public sector. We play a very important role. And to that extent, we bring about good governance. To that extent, we promote democracy. When you have democracy, women's rights are protected. I'm not saying that it's outright, but you discover that they are better protected in a democratic setting when it's actually democracy. Then you find 
also that women protect children. We, we, we take care of the children. The children are our future. This continent has a lot of youths now, and the youths are supposed to be educated. They are supposed to be nurtured by women. When these women nurture the youths appropriately, they, they grow up to, I mean, run away from violence. So women play a critical role in impacting knowledge, in bringing up children with attitudes towards peace, towards non-violence. So women play a critical role in peace building. Women play a critical role even in CSO, because if you don't have women in, in, in um, CSO, you have problem. It's, it's, it's still the same problem we talk about. It means you are excluding them. You need to, we're talking about inclusivity. Women have to be present everywhere, present in governance, present in negotiation, in mediation, in, in, in every process that you think of, because we are sharing equal opportunity, equal rights with men. We are created equal. The Constitution says that, fundamental human rights says that, the law of God says that, I don't see anywhere that is said that men are not equal to women, except that in our minds we decide that we don't want to give it to women. So women have been very, very instrumental. They play the role of expert. In CSO, we play expert roles. We, we, we advise, we play advisory roles. That's what um, this woman, um, Bigombe, played with the LRA. She used her expertise as a mediator, a top international mediator, to invite the LRA. She went inside in the jungle to meet Rebels, these are very dangerous gangsters. This woman was courageous enough to meet them face to face, and you still think she's not able. So women are, what's that to me, sorry, thank you. So women are capable, and they play very critical and important roles in our society. And the other issue I want to talk about, very important, is that the, the, the um, early warning and um, trauma healing, Women are very, very important in those roles. If you go to the communities, you discover that the reconciliation, women actually initiate reconciliation. They, they bring people together. We, 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 are, we are always initiating reconciliation, and we also heal by doing that. So this is very important. Men don't do that often. Women do this perfectly. They do it so well, because women are natural mediators. They mediate. I mean, in a way that brings people together. This is a very important issue. You, you have trauma healing in a conflict ridden continent like this. You need that, you need women, and women play this role so well. I mean, why do you do away with a solution and stick to a problem when you have the solution right in, in, in front of you? Women are very good development <laughs> agents, and I think we have to respect that. Ex respect the women agency, respect the women's roles, respect the power of women. We've seen it happen, and we've seen that women have played very critical role, especially in Africa. I'm talking about Africa because I've seen it physically. I know, I know, I, I know the, um, the, the two women I mentioned, I know them very well, and I've asked them questions. They are very, very courageous women, and they make me so proud. We have so many women like that who have not been given the opportunity. I hope that the United Nations will make sure that 1325 becomes totally effective. It is implemented because we're still there. We're, we're not there yet. We're just, I mean, trying to make it happen. So we are praying that they do that, and they not just talk, but actually walk the talk. Thank you.